Amen. Thank you. Very true and very scriptural. Acts chapter 17. Again, visitors, we're glad that you're here. We do hope this is a, a help to you. And we appreciate some who come up on vacation and appreciate you staying faithful to the Lord and coming to the house of God. We hope to be an encouragement to you. And I know we have some military, I think, just getting in the area. We're certainly glad that you're here. We appreciate your service to our country. Even if you are Army, we still appreciate it. We really do. And we have some of Nic Nicholas' family here. We should be praying for them because they're with Nicola. As you can see, Chris is even up here. He knows what to do. He's, he's learned. <laughs> Acts chapter 17. Let's start reading there in verse number 16. Verse number 16 of Acts chapter. Again, we are in the book of Acts. This is not part of my series of going through the book right now. We are doing that on Sunday mornings. And although that has been moved for Sunday nights just temporarily... Uh, as we'll begin the book of Ruth two weeks from today, and that really is only, only going to take about five to eight Sundays to finish the book of Ruth, and then we'll switch Acts back to Sunday morning at that time, but this is separate from that series. But now, Acts chapter 17, verse number 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. It's everywhere. Therefore... Disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others, uh, uh, other some, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine wherefore thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, that these things mean. I want you to think about that. There's 30,000 different gods in Athens at this time. They're hearing something different. It's grabbing their attention. Verse number 21. For all the Athenians and strangers which were, which were there spent their time in nothing else but to either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood up in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens... I perceive that in all things you are too spirit, uh, 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 superstitious. Excuse me. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Amen. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Boy, we could learn from that. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, and move, and have our being. And certain also of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art and man's device. At the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, wherefore he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now he gets interrupted. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we will hear again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. How be it? 
certain men clave unto him and believed. Among the which was uh, Dionysus, the uh, Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, uh, uh, Lord, I do love you. I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, please help me to be a help to your people. Help me to preach your truth. I pray that this would help us and draw us closer to you, that it would strengthen us, Lord, that it would encourage us. Lord, please use this to be a help. Lord, I pray that you control what I say and how I say it. Lord, if there's anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, I pray for that conviction and that drawing, that even this morning they would repent and place their faith in Jesus Christ. May you be glorified, Lord. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. We live today in what is referred to as a post-Christian culture. And what we mean by that is in times past, America was very much a Christian culture. The worldview of America for the longest time frame was a Christian worldview. That certainly does not mean that all were Christians, not by, not by any stretch of the imagination. But nonetheless, America was a Christian nation with a Christian worldview because it had permeated all parts of the culture. Sunday was a day of worship. That was standard in America everywhere you went. There was a basis for morality, and the nation knew that basis was the Bible. People would live in a Christian manner, so to speak. It used to be a common saying that if somebody did something wrong... They would, it, the common thing to say was this, that was not a Christian thing to do. That's because it was a Christian worldview. It did not mean all were saved, certainly all were not. But that was what permeated the culture. That is no longer true today. We no longer live in a Christian culture. That's why we use the term post-Christian culture. The fact that this change has occurred, it has affected churches. Today, many churches are struggling with how to deal with this change. Because before, so much of what would be in the church would be in the culture as well. But that's because the culture was Christian. But as we've become a post-Christian culture, many are still trying to pull from the culture that is now wicked and still bring it into the church. They believe the philosophy that you have to become like the world to win the world. There has been a movement sometime, even within independent Baptist churches, trying to convince them that they do need to be like the world. That's how you're going to be effective. They use a verse like 1 Corinthians 9.22 to justify this. Where Paul talked about becoming all things to all men. Paul in no way was talking about adapting any pagan aspect. He defines what he means in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. What he's saying was he would not use his liberty in Christ to offend. In other words, if he happened to be eating in a place where they had believed it was wrong to eat meat, he knew it wasn't. So he would not use his liberty to offend. But he never brought something pagan into the church. That never took place. But we're not going to look at that today. I have a whole separate sermon on that 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 you can go online and find. Today what I want us to see is Paul in action in Athens in this pagan, Christless culture. I want us to see the importance of, 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 of witnessing and how Paul went about this. How Paul reached this culture here in Athens, which was far from God. Stressing the importance of being when you present the gospel. So we need to look at what Athens looked like in the day of Paul. To see what Paul was facing. Keep in mind, Paul had just been in Berea. He was run out of town. He was escorted out for his own safety. Um, Silas and Timothy stayed behind, but they sent Paul ahead, believing he was in danger, to Athens. He's going to stay in Athens, and he's going to wait uh, uh, for Timothy and Silas to join him there. From there, they would continue. So he's there, and he's waiting for them. Paul was on his way to Corinth, and the plan was to meet up in Athens. 
Paul, while waiting in Athens, of course, tours the city, but not as a tourist. This city is no longer the political power it once was back when Greece in the days of Alexander the Great had dominated. It's still a very influential city, but not nearly like it was. It's not even the economic capital of its region. That would be Corinth. <clears throat> but it was still a great city. It was considered the education city of the world, the university city of the world. It was still the home and was the home of the great philosophers, the city of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. There were great temples to see, the temple to Zeus, theaters, markets. It was called the Eye of Greece. It was called, that referred to as the mother, at this time, the mother of arts and eloquence. Again, as I've already mentioned, there were said to be about 30,000 gods in Athens. Outrageous. Many of these, of course, you can see the evidence all over as Paul was walking. Many of these have survived to this day. There's evidence of many of those gods still, still prevalent and, and taking shape in artwork and different things in art, even to this day. So we have to understand how Paul viewed this city. You can just imagine Paul walking around, seeing all the idolatry everywhere. Here he is. This is a man who has truth. He serves the true and living God. He sees men just like him, believing that this thing created from man's own image out of silver and gold is somehow God. And it's everywhere. The ignorance, the blindness. Paul is seeing this. He sees a city that is not only consumed with idolatry, but Athens would very much be consumed with the sensual. Much like our culture. Sensuality would be one of the driving factors in Athens in Paul's day. There would be prostitution, parties, pleasure seeking everywhere. <clears throat> It's also important to understand the demographics. Athens was made up primarily, of course, of the common man who would be wholly given to idolatry, as Paul put it. Not only given to the idolatry, but also the sensuality. There's another group we're introduced here that was part of Athens, and those were the Epicureans. They were the philosophers of their day. They were not idolaters. They were atheistic and very proud to be atheists. They were the intellectuals of their day. They did not believe in any God. They would mock those who did. They believed when a man died, that was it. It was over with. They denied any life after death. They are also very materialistic. Since they believed this life was it, they believed you lived to get the most out of it. Therefore, their life too became about pleasure. It was a virtue. Pleasure was a virtue to them. Pain was the opposite. Their motto was, of the Epicureans was, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They were what we would call today existentialists, living for the experience of the moment. And this is still a popular philosophy of our day right now, as we've entered a post-Christian culture. We also have the Stoics that are part of the culture of Athens, that are mentioned in our text. This group was pantheistic. In other words, they believed God was in all. By the way, please, Christians, watch out for pantheism. It creeps in in subtle ways. And yes, it's strong here in our culture still, and it creeps in even in the churches. It is the belief that God is in all and does not exist as his own separate entity. God is in the rocks and the trees and the mountains, anything material. The Stoics prided themselves about being level-headed, taking whatever comes at them. They were also fatalistic. That just means that they, they believed things were predetermined. You weren't going to change an outcome. It was already set what was going to take place, and you weren't going to change it. <clears throat> Paul will be brought before all three of these groups. Paul is brought to Mars Hill. It was a true hill, of course, there in Athens. Um, and the meaning of it goes much deeper. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later in the message. But at Mars Hill was the, Areop was the Areopagus, which was basically the court for the city. It's where the, where, uh, the authorities of the city would meet and, and decide on judicial matters that needed to be settled in the city. 
This is where Paul is going to be brought before. <clears throat> so Paul is walking around Athens. He sees this major city completely given over to idolatry. Idols everywhere. People praying to them. He sees philosophers who are both atheistic and living for pleasure and stoics who simply believed God is in everything. When he sees this, his first response is he heads to the synagogue, as was his custom, then to the market, and he preaches there. It's while he's at the market that some of the Epicureans and Stoics hear him, and they bring him before the court. They want to listen to him. He's, he's not to be judged. Well, if anything, his words were to be judged, I should say. They want to hear what he has to say. It is here that he will preach the gospel. So this is the setting for what takes place in Acts chapter 17. So let's learn a little bit from Paul then how Paul handles this. It was an amazing opportunity that was put before him, and he did not neglect it. The first thing we see is in verse 16. Let's go right back to our very first verse. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. The first thing the Bible tells us about Paul when he sees what is taking place, it uses the word stir. His spirit is stirred. It means he was provoked. It has the meaning of being greatly bothered. He was not just looking around in amazement at the art and the architecture, going, wow, look at that. There was something else he was seeing, and it was greatly bothering him. It was provoking him. His spirit was stirred. This was a man who was clearly spiritually sensitive. He was not looking as a tourist, but as an ambassador for God. It would have been easy for Paul, with all that he had just been through at Thessalonica, at Berea, on this mission trip, just to say, I'm just going to take a couple days and relax and enjoy the sights. So he gets to Athens, and he says, I've got a couple days here to kill. And he starts to walk around. But he can't enjoy the architecture. He can't enjoy the art the structures that were built there. He can't even enjoy the city, the, the history of this great city of his day. He's greatly bothered as he sees the false gods everywhere. As he walks by a group of men, some Epicureans talking about their philosophy, maybe hears them mocking some of the idol worship, how there is no God, we're just here. It stirs his spirit as he sees the wickedness, the blindness, those going about in such great ignorance as to what is true. When he saw the wickedness, he saw the need. His spirit was stirred. Too often today we have churches and Christians not stirred or provoked by our culture, but desiring to imitate it in the name of evangelism. Or some just write it off as hopeless. Well, nothing we could do here. The reality is we need our spirit stirred to action as we look at our culture. We are too often just looking around in amazement or disbelief or disappointment, yet we need our spirit stirred to action. Paul looked at the city of Athens through spiritual eyes, and saw the true spiritual condition of the city. He didn't care about all the things that would one day burn up and be destroyed. He knew it was nothing, it was vanity. They have nice buildings, but he knew it's all going to burn one day. It really is nothing. Especially compared to the architecture that he is going to see one day. He saw all the glamour of Athens, but he saw all the idolatry and, knowing, uh, and he knew how, how it kept the people so blinded from the true God. He was burdened by what he saw. His response wasn't to go and isolate himself in a compound. It 
It's the fact of the stirring of his spirit that moves him to action to get truth out. If we're going to take action, our spirits have to be stirred. Not only was he stirred, we see the next thing that happens as a result of being stirred is seeking. <clears throat> Verse 16, he sees the city stirred, the city's holy given to idolatry. Then we have the therefore. The therefore is there because of verse 16. He heads to the synagogue and to the markets, and it begins to preach. In other words, what we see taking place now, he's seeking, he's looking for opportunities. So he does what, what was Paul's custom to do. He heads first because he believed it was right due to the, 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 the nation of Israel, Israel's history being God's people. And so he heads to the synagogue first. He's moved to action. Of course, those in the synagogue would be a very small group in the community, literally very tiny, probably not even close to making up a percentage. These people were not idolaters at all. Yet they didn't have truth, and there's no way they had the ability to make a difference in Athens, and Paul knew it. Not only does he head to the synagogue, but by the text, it's clear what he did. He heads to the market, the gathering place, and he actually sets up a daily time to begin to preach and teach the Bible with those who would come and listen. So what do we have him doing now? After he stirred, he immediately looks for opportunity. He starts seeking. He just doesn't pray, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like all of them. I thank you that I have found truth. I have no doubt that he imagined himself as one of them. Growing up in that culture. Being taught, being taught, you know, do you see that mountain right there? God is in that mountain. Or being taught by some fat little image. Here's your God. He knew what it would, what it would be like to be raised in that culture. And he's trying to relate to it. And he knows how desperately they need the simplicity that is in Christ. And so as he's preaching, you can just imagine it getting the ears of all the people. Because it's true. You will miss all of your opportunities that God gives you unless you are stirred. God will put opportunities before you all the time. But if you are not stirred, spiritually speaking, you will miss every single one of those. Could you imagine right now growing up today in a household in America? Unchurched thinking that those who actually attend church, believing this, because it's how it's presented in this post-Christian culture, that those who attend church are the wicked ones. And you grow up believing that. When you begin to see the need, you'll begin to look for the opportunities. They will be there. Sometimes they'll be there just just one on one examples. Again, I think of that guy at, at, at coming to mind right now, Books a Million. When I just got back on a furlough, my laptop had broken. I took it to to the Best Buy to get it fixed, and there was a Books a Million next door. So I I just gotten down. I hadn't been to a bookstore yet, so I said, I'm going. I'm going to Books a Million. I walk in there. I'm in the in the religious section. There's another guy there in his uh, work uniform. And he was, he was well down the aisle from me. He called actually unto me. I didn't quite, I knew he was there, but we really didn't pay attention to him. And then he had called me over and he said, hey, could you help me find a Bible? He said, I need to find an ESV. And I said, I said sure, I, I, I can help you with that. I said, but why do, you need to, why do you need to find a Bible? And he said, he was a, he was a big guy, and he said, he said, I just went to church for the first time in a very long time on Sunday. And, and the pastor had said, um, that's, what I, that's what I need to go and find. And you could just tell, looking at him, he was troubled. There was no doubt. Something was bothering this guy. And I said, I said you know those bookstores, they have coffee places right in them. I said, would you like to sit down and talk? I said, I'm actually a pastor, a missionary. And he said, I would. And we went and we sat down. And boy, this guy just started crying. His wife just left him. 
He had been a horrible husband. And he said, I know it's my fault. Just been a horrible husband. She had enough and she left. And then I got into the gospel. I think it's one of the very few times this has ever happened to me. Once I got near the end, I presented the entire gospel, I didn't have to ask him anything. Right there, on his own, he put his faith in Christ out loud. Tears, and then where he was from, there had to be a supporting church. He was, he was from about two hours away. Had to be a supporting church of mine right there in that area, right where he was from. And then he did leave with a King James Bible, by the way, so you know. After he was stirred, he was seeking. He was looking for opportunities. If our heart isn't stirred, we will miss the opportunities. The next test we see taking place is the best one of all, sovereignty. We see God move now. We see God's providence come into play. Look what takes place. Verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine wherefore thou speakest is. He is brought before the court of Athens. You see God in this. This is God's providence, God's sovereignty at work. He is putting Paul, not just before the common man, but before the leaders of the city. God's providence is at work. His sovereignty is at play. He's brought before the multitudes, before the high court. And I love what Paul does. He says, you have this marker to the unknown God. And I brought it up here before in sermons at different times, usually during missions conferences. But there's a story. That wasn't arbitrary why he did that. There's a story behind that, that that unknown God was in fact Jehovah God. Paul knew the story. He references it later when he refers to the poets. The unknown God in Mars Hill was due to an, an event that had taken, I, I, I tried to, I couldn't find the book in my office that has a story in it. I, I meant to read it before I got it to refresh my memory on it. I, I believe it was somewhere around 150 years before this time, but I really can't remember. Before Paul was preaching on Mars Hill, an event had taken place in Athens where some type of plague was coming through and people were dying. Um, and this was a serious one. It, it, it wasn't like COVID. I mean, there's a lot of people dropping dead and they don't know what's going on. They're doing the sacrifices to all their false gods. It's not ending it. They're doing whatever they can. Nothing is see, it seems to stop it. They're trying to get help from wherever they can. They know some sickness has hit and it's bad. They bring in an outsider, a man in for wisdom to try and help them. The man gets there. He sees what's taking place and he says, you know what? I think there's an unknown God. I think there's a God we don't know about. I think that's the God you need to talk to. They agreed. And so to try and put a test to it, put, a, put, a, put out a fleece, if you will, to see if that's true, is there an unknown God? They used Mars Hill to determine that. They took a bunch of sheep and had them fast. They caged them and had them fast. Mars Hill was a, was a common grazing area with good grass. They loved to eat and whatnot, I guess. And so, anyhow, they brought them out there. And then they, before they released them, they had them fast. They weren't allowed to eat for a time frame, so they know they would be hungry and want to eat. While they were still caged, they prayed to the unknown God. And they were praying and asking, listen, if you're there, show us. We need your help. If it's true that you are there, when we release the sheep, don't let them eat. Just let them sit down. And they prayed to the unknown God to stop the plague. The time came to release the sheep. They came out. They just sat down. The plague stopped. By the way, do you know what they did, even in their ignorance? Which is amazing when you think about it, considering the time frame. They sacrificed a lamb unto the unknown God. Paul used that as the springboard. He said, I'm here to tell you about that God you don't know. I know who he is. 
and he preaches unto them the gospel. Listen, as we follow God by faith, we'll see his providence and his sovereignty come into play. Well, he, where, where God will begin directing based on our obedience and our faith. Just like we see, I don't know if it's going to work out right now, but the fact of the open door of the radio market in San Francisco, I can't take that as a coincidence. I can't. Fourth largest market in the nation. Probably the most wicked city in the nation. Then we have Paul from verse 22 through 31, as I finish this up, preaching the gospel. As a result of, of his spirit being stirred, him seeking opportunities, and upon that act of faith by Paul, we see God's sovereignty come into play. He's faithful with it, and he preaches the gospel. He preaches Christ, and he doesn't hold back. This is key to us right now. We need to get this today in the day we live in in this post-Christian culture. What Paul knew is what he even stressed in the book of Romans. The power to reach others is always in the gospel itself. That's what it's in. It's not in relationship building. It's in the gospel. I'm for relationship building. I am. That's not the key. The key is always in the gospel. I've used relationship building. It is. But don't let that hinder. I don't have that relationship built yet. Listen, if you have those around you on a common basis, co-workers, build a relationship that will allow you to get the gospel. I don't have a problem with that. But don't wait until some magical moment where the relationship is built where you can present the gospel. The power to reach them isn't in that relationship. It's in the gospel. I'll give you a good example. I had a guy in New Guinea, a store owner. who's a Chinese man, a, 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 a Buddhist. And I met him when I first got there, and, and he had tried to be helped to me throughout the years that I was there. And, and, and I'd witnessed him a lot, and for the most part, didn't want to have much to do with it, you know. And, and he was my very last convert. When I, I had, we, we, were, we were leaving the country, we actually flew out, we're in Port Moors, we left the island, New Ireland, we're in the capital city, getting ready to get on a plane to leave. We're done. And he contacted me, wanted to meet me at that airport. And so Ong shows up at the airport. And he wanted to hear the gospel again. And right there, he put his faith in Christ. By the way, he went back and he got baptized. Got in the church. But he told me. He didn't, he didn't use the relationship. But I knew it wasn't the result of the relationship I built with him. He said what made a difference to him in what was true because... New Guinea claims to be a Christian culture. There's Catholic in the United Church are everywhere, but it's just, it's just so wicked and vile, though, everywhere. Was one of the converts that worked for him. Puce. He said, I could trust him. I can give him money. He wouldn't steal a penny. What he saw was the difference of a changed life. That's what made the difference to him. The key to us reaching our culture is not us setting up a rock band. Listen, our responsibility here for a, as a local church is not to fill the pews. It's to fill the pulpit with truth. That's what it is. As we go out and we reach our culture, listen, there are people who will, will hear and come to know Christ. I don't have to go get tattoos and preach in little skinny jeans to try and make somebody feel comfortable. What's going to lead to their conversion is going to be the gospel itself. If they're not converted by the gospel, then it's a false gospel. It's something else keeping them here. I remember talking with one person. See, it's not about us being cool. I had a conversation with a, a saved wife. And during this, during this conversation, um, I have one wife. I'm not talking about one of mine. It was just another... I have some that are lost and some that are saved. Um, as, and that might have sounded odd there. Um, <laughs> it was a, a church member, a wife and, uh, of another man, and we're talking about witnessing. And she had made the statement to me that she did not want to dress Amish so she, she witnessed to people they would listen. For one, I've never advocated dressing, dressing Amish. 
I will advocate, preach, and teach dressing modestly because it's what the Bible teaches. And I, I, I knew thinking, that person has the wrong key. It's not about you looking cool before them that's going to reach them. It's not. It's about actually presenting the gospel. And by the way, I never knew that person to ever present the gospel to one person. Ever. You'll be amazed if you'll simply present the gospel effectively. Just like Paul did, and they were hearing that, like, what? How it grabs. Because there's a whole other element at work, and that's God's mighty Holy Spirit touching those hearts. Listen to this. Listen to this. Just hitting those, those atheists, those Epicureans' heart, get him. Put him before the council. You need to hear this. It was truth. Paul also knew his audience. He knew his audience. He was looking to be effective with the gospel. And boy, look at that in verses 29 and 30 and on there. Boy, does he point out their sin. He does. He doesn't hold back from the idolatry. He doesn't try and cover it up like Smiley does when asked about different sins in our nation. Oh, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave that to God. Do you understand that without conviction on a heart, there will be no conversion? Paul was not preaching what was popular in Athens. He was preaching what the culture needed to hear. And doing it in love, not out of pride. Let's separate that too right now, because that comes about way too much in our day. We also see, not only did he point out their sin, but in verse 30, he demanded repentance. And there's not much of that today. Repentance is turning from whatever else it is you're trusted in to Christ alone. Not mixing it. Seeing the direction your life is heading and knowing you need Christ and that he is the answer and turning to him. We see in verse 34 when it ends here that Paul, what's interesting here, when he preached, let me separate for a second the synagogue he was in from Athens. All right? Paul has the exact same response from both cultures. The synagogue and the culture there that was monotheistic, as well as the culture in Athens, which was polytheistic, idolatry, and atheistic, and everything else, pantheistic, and all that stuff. But he had the same response. Some believed, many rejected. That's what took place. Do you know what's going to happen for us right here in Anchorage as we stay faithful and follow God? Some will believe, many will reject. And we stay faithful to that. That's what we do. So in conclusion... Take notice of what Paul did not use to reach Athens. He did not change or water down the message to make it more palatable to those who were in Athens. He stayed with the same truth even though he knew it would be convicted. When he's before the leaders of the city, the city full of pride because of their culture. And he's telling them, by the way, all these gods you worship, it's wrong. There's nothing to it. I know you consider yourselves intellectuals, you atheists, but you're wrong. There's a real God and a real creator. Nor did Paul go and set up for... He he did not sit down and, let's have a strategy meeting. We're going to go set up a philosophy club. We're going to come in the back door here. He didn't do that. He preached the gospel. Nor did he establish the Athen Angels CCM band. He didn't say, I've got to get a worship team together if we're going to do this. I'm going to make them look as worldly as possible in the music that they love. Let's come up here and let's reach them. He preached the gospel. Effectively. Not just running through Romans 3, 10, 3, 23, 5, 8, 6, 23, Romans 10, now, now say this prayer. He preached it Effectively. He did not use marketing methods. He focused on the gospel. 
And it's true, by the way, because the scripture teaches it. Many will be offended by the gospel. Paul was stoned over it. Thrown in prison over it. That happens. It's a reality. But you understand, we have truth. We have the answer of what our culture needs right now. Whether it's a religious blinded culture or our culture heading into such secularism and humanism right now. Completely blinded to what is true. I'll never forget Henry. I was thinking about him this week. Uh, when mission, the missionary who was here preaching, Brother Kratz, had asked about him. This is in my first term, and Daniel was with him. Where's Daniel at? Oh, right here. Oh, front row. I asked him something. He's there. Front row. Do you remember Henry in New Hanover? One of my favorite converts in my time in, in PNG. Terry Thrun, missionary that was in about five hours from us in the north part of the island at the time, had asked if I'd come and preach a meeting for him on another island called New Hanover. And so I said, I, I certainly would. And so he had arranged it. I just had to show up, get on the little boat, and head over there. And it was still, still my entire time in PNG. It was the most isolated location I was in. We had about a three-hour boat ride on the ocean. Then we took that same boat. Once we got to the island, we had to find a certain river that was out to the ocean and then go up that river several more hours and then hike even more hours to get to the location. And if you know me, I'm from Cleveland. I don't like any of that. <laughs> if not for preaching, I'm not going. Just send me pictures. I'm good. And so we get there, and uh, um, it was, you know, this, there's not a, even a road on this island. There's nothing like that at all. The meet, first meeting is going to be that very evening that I arrived. I'm going to be there, I think, was it preaching for three nights, and, uh, and then coming back. The first night sets in, and people begin to show up, and it's, we got, we got, uh, just, uh, what's those lights? I can't think of the name, the lanterns. Pressure lamps, you know, with gas oil heat, providing light and everything like that for the meeting. They're all set up. And uh, we begin to preach, I begin to preach, and I was preaching from uh, the story of Naaman when Naaman got converted. I still remember the sermon. It was on the simplicity of God's salvation. How Naaman almost missed it because he expected it to be a lot harder. And so I preach the message, and I get near the end, and, I, and I'm trying to weed through of who God's generally dealing with here. And it gets down to three men, and their hands go up, and the man who organized the meeting comes running to me. He said, that man right there, that's Henry. He's the pastor of the United Church. And I said, I'll take him. And I took him aside, and I went over the gospel with him. I'm in the middle of it. I'll never forget it. I'm in the middle of presenting him the gospel and tears just start streaming down his face. He's the pastor of the church. He said, I never knew this. I never knew this. And of course, he put his faith in Christ right there. Amen. Put his faith in Christ right there. And then he talked how his family and his church need to hear that. By the way, the next night, we had three more saved the next night. It was the deacon of the United Church that got converted the next night. Henry came back with us, by the way, for additional training from Terry Thrum before we sent him back um, to New Hanover. The answer's in the gospel. By the way, when I went and preached that meeting, I didn't put on a lap lap. I didn't do a traditional dance. I preached the gospel. That's what I did. If we're going to be effective, we've got to be stirred by what's taking place in our culture. Not stirred by long lines and bad drivers but stirred, spiritually speaking, to take some genuine action. With heads bowed and eyes closed.